On June 10th, 2016, at about 3 a.m., a 911 call was received by the Gresham Police Department in Oregon. 911. Oh, I'm sorry to tell you. 911, how can I help you? I'm sorry to tell you. What happened? I'm going to be on first floor. Somebody try. Where is this person out na at now? I'm not here. Do you need an ambulance? Yes. No. Do you know the name of the person that did this to you? No. Are you bleeding a lot? No. Okay. I'm getting lots of help heading in that direction, okay? Can you tell me what your name is? As you have just heard, the caller was a 34-year-old woman by the name Anastasia Hester, or Annie for short. The crime scene was her apartment on the ground floor of the East Park apartment complex. When police and paramedics arrived, they found the front door unlocked. Upon entering the apartment, the first thing that they noticed were bloody footprints stamped on the floor, leading to the front door. Annie was found near the back of the apartment in the living room, next to a sofa bed that she was likely sleeping in before the attack took place. She was still alive, but she was quickly bleeding out due to the startling amount of lacerations found all over her body. In order to avoid disturbing the footprint evidence, the paramedics carried her out through the back door, tore down a portion of a fence, and brought her to the ambulance. She was immediately transported to the hospital. As law enforcement was walking back towards the apartment, the detectives noticed that a window was left open at the back of the apartment. Directly below that window was a cinder block. It was believed that the perpetrator used this cinder block as a way to climb in and out through the window. The detectives headed back inside and found the same window. This window led to a child's bedroom. However, there was no child in the apartment. Afraid that a potential kidnapping had occurred, the top priority before examining the rest of the crime scene was to confirm the safety of this child. After making a few phone calls, they were able to determine that the child was Anastasia's daughter named Alice. Based on a custody agreement, Alice was at her father Matthew Hester's house in Portland that night, about 25 minutes away. After ruling out a kidnapping, the detectives were now able to focus on examining the rest of the crime scene. A few feet away from where Annie was found, laid a pocket knife, and out in the hallway laid two more knives, including a steak knife and an 8-inch carving knife. It was later determined that all three knives were used in the attack. As they continued examining the crime scene, the police got the bad news. Annie had tragically succumbed to her injuries. The police then went on to gathering more information from Annie's neighbors. Several of them described hearing a woman screaming during the night of the attack at around 11 p.m. Then, over the course of four hours, there was a loud thud moaning, and what sounded like a conversation coming from Annie's apartment. At around 3 a.m., more screaming, followed by a door slamming and the sounds of a car driving away. Despite hearing all of these jarring sounds, not one neighbor called 911. One person even said that they tried to drown out the commotion by turning on music and their bathroom fan. Anyway, Annie's autopsy later revealed that she had sustained more than 60 stab wounds. Some wounds were less than one inch deep, and others were up to eight inches deep. One particular area of injuries caught the investigators' attention. Carved onto Annie's shoulders were the symbols VXV. It seemed clear that the nature of this crime was not only premeditated, but likely personal. Therefore, investigators wanted to question someone who knew the ins and outs of Annie's life. Typically, this person would be a spouse, but since Annie wasn't married, they started with her ex-husband, Matt Hester. Yeah, go ahead and have a seat. I'll be with you in a minute. As you can see, Matt seems to be having some trouble walking. This is due to an undiagnosed medical problem that has left Matt in constant pain and unable to walk. And so I guess, um, obviously I told you at the house that your ex-wife is deceased. Mm -hmm. You didn't say? Didn't say how or anything. We'll talk about that in a minute or two. Okay. Um, she said that she had been stabbed. Officers responded down there. Um, she had been injured. She was transported to the hospital, and she was pronounced dead at the hospital. And at this point, we're investigating this as homicide. Did your wife say any ex-wife say anything about having any problems with anyone? I don't talk about her personal life. When did you and Anne first meet? Uh, we first met in 1999 uh, through a mutual friend. Matt and Annie had actually met while Matt was still in another relationship. He went on to marry this other woman, but a divorce followed just a couple of years later. Why did you guys uh, get divorced? Angie and I. Okay. 
Then, in 2008, less than two years after his first divorce, Matt married Annie. Three years after that, in 2011, they gave birth to their daughter, Alice. But the marriage was still rocky, despite their new ball of sunshine. I ended up cheating on her. Mm -hmm. I'm not very good at this relationship thing. When Matt and Annie's relationship began falling apart, the couple decided to try an open relationship on the condition that they remained honest about their affairs. Matt was unable to keep his word, and this became the reason that they officially ended their marriage. How are your feelings towards Anne? I'm mostly indifferent. I just, I, I want to deal with her as little as possible. I love being a dad. Annie maintained full custody of Alice, while Matt only had her on scheduled weekends. This arrangement was not sufficient for Matt, and he would constantly express how he wished he could spend more time with his daughter. Unfortunately, Matt's track record made this impossible. He would regularly fail to pay his monthly child support payments, which he would then blame on his injury and his inability to hold a job. In an attempt to cut down on his rent costs, Matt welcomed a new roommate, a single mother of three named Angela Rose McCraw. Within a month, the roommates became romantically involved and went on to get married in 2014. So what were you and Angela doing last night? Sleeping. Okay. Do you know what time you went to bed? Um, I usually get into bed around 10 o'clock. Okay. And was Angela with you or was she staying up doing other things? She was with me a bit. In another room down the hall, Angela was also questioned. I have a seat uh, right there. Okay. I was on the verge of falling asleep to some criminal minds. When you guys are sleeping, who gets the inside and who gets the outside? Matt's against the wall. Any chance that uh, Matthew could have gone anywhere some sometime during the night? Oh, God, every time he moves, he wakes me up, so it's okay. not a possibility. And I sleep, like, literally right up against him in his arms. If he would have gotten up out of bed, you would... You Most definitely. Matt and Angela both handed over their phones at the end of their interviews. The detectives planned to download the GPS data and other assets to help with the investigation. It seemed that they both had the same story, in bed by 10 p.m. and sleeping the entire night. To corroborate these alibis, the police went on to question Matt and Angela's three other roommates, beginning with Aaron McCraw. Aaron is actually Angela's ex-husband and the father of two of her children, so he spent most of his nights at her house. Yeah, our relationship is a little weird. But that night in particular, Aaron was neither at home nor at Angela's. Instead, he was at his girlfriend's house. You were staying at your girlfriend's? I was... Staying at home. I was not at home. I was at my girlfriend's. The detectives were not able to extract any useful information from Aaron, so they moved on to roommate number two. There is not a lot of information about this roommate's questioning, but he essentially said that he was out on the night of the murders came back around midnight and saw Matt and Angela sleeping in the same bed together. He then went straight to bed. Considering that the crime took place between 11 p.m. and 3 a.m., seeing Matt and Angela in bed at midnight meant that roommate number two was another witness that supported their alibi. They moved on to the third and final roommate, Karina Walters. I live with Matt and Angela. Due to the growing rent prices in Portland, Karina had no fixed address until Angela offered her a place to stay. She then started sleeping in Angela's garage for the time being. This meant that she could hear the family vehicle, a silver Mazda SUV, any time it started up. You ever hear them coming and going? Yeah. Um, my, Like I said, I live in the garage, mm -hmm. and the garage door is really thin. So if their car starts up, I don't know if you, you haven't heard their car, of course no. not. Um, it makes this really god-awful rattling noise when it starts up. Okay. And... If they were to go anywhere, it would make it, I'm pretty positive it would wake me up, but they never go anywhere. Did Matt leave last night at all? No. Did Angela leave at all? No. Karina also shared that she had gone to the bathroom between 3 and 4 a.m., walking past Matt and Angela in bed on the way. They were asleep. Angela snores. If Angela or Matt were responsible for this and you knew it. I would turn them in in a heartbeat. Okay. You wouldn't protect them in any aspect? Hell no. Okay. Are Matt and Angela into threesomes, groupies, girl-on-girl, -girl, guy and guy anything like that, or is it all pretty normal? It's very normal with them. While these interviews were useful in corroborating Matt and Angela's alibi, they also pointed investigators in the direction of more potential suspects. 
It turns out that Annie was involved in a Venn diagram of communities. On one side was the pirate role-playing community, where people would dress up and act like pirates together. On the other side was a sexual fetish community, and in the middle was a crossbreed of both, where people would role-play as pirates during sexual encounters. It was in this subsection that Annie and her polyamorous partners resided. They would often go out to what are referred to as dungeon parties, a social gathering which allows them and other pirates to explore their wildest fantasies. Considering the love that pirates have for blades, this could explain the fascination that the killers seem to have with using them, using multiple knives to carry out the murder. However, after questioning Annie's partners and other contacts in the pirate community, they were all ruled out as potential suspects since their alibis panned out. After each of these leads took investigators to a dead end, they decided to go with their gut and brought Matt and Angela back in for questioning. I'm just going to keep my eyes shut and my head down. Okay. How did it make you feel when you heard about her being killed? Shocked. Mm -hmm. um, Non-believing. Um, extremely sad because <laughs> Alice had lost her mom. Did you guys sleep well? What happened? Did you get through the night? or? For the most part, we slept just fine until my dog started whining. Do you remember like, uh, looking at a clock? Or? I half opened my eye to look at the clock slightly and see that it was around 3. Okay. Did you actually end up having to get out of bed to let him out? Or? Yeah, I got up, walked downstairs, put their leashes on, took them potty, came back upstairs, put them in their kennels. Mm-hmm. And then I went to go potty and end up, end up puking and myself at the same time. Oh, that's horrible. I'm sorry. And th that's why I called Matt to help me, and he came and helped me. He took a shower to help get the poop off and rinse some of the sweat off of me because apparently I was sweating. <laughs> This chain of events, which Angela had conveniently left out in the last police interview, shed a new light on her and Matt's timeline. The detectives wanted to know if Matt had the same recollection. They questioned him again, this time applying more pressure. I mean, obviously, we got to consider all possibilities here, and mm -hmm. I'm sure you've seen TV. When we have situations like this, you know, everybody points to the ex-husband did it. I want to help you guys. Because, I, and I, I want to... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I think I'm worried about is my daughter. <laughs> Matt, if you had anything to do with Anne's death, I need to know about it right now. I did not. I okay. would never do anything that would endanger my child. Okay. And I'm glad to hear you say that because that tells me what kind of parent you are. Is there any reason why I find your DNA no. involved in that murder scene? No. The detectives proceeded to ask Matt if he would take off his shirt to which he cooperated. If Matt was responsible for the brutal stabbing, they would expect him to have some sort of mark or defensive wound on him from the ordeal. However, there was no visible markings on Mark's body that could confirm his involvement. Do you know what kind of shoes you have? These are boots. What size? Uh, 11 and a half wide. Okay. The reason they just asked Matt's shoe size was to rule out a connection to the bloody footprints. The footprints matched a nine and a half size boot. It was at this point that they asked Matt about Angela's story of waking up at 3 a.m. and Matt helping her shower. Matt responded by saying that he heard Angela get up at 3 a.m. to let the dogs out, but he didn't get out of bed at all. With their stories not lining up, the detectives knew that somebody was lying. They called Matt's bluff with a bluff of their own, claiming to have evidence that tied Matt directly to the crime scene. I need to let you know that my investigation clearly shows that you're responsible for Anne's death and you're involved in it intimately. There's well, then you would have charged me. So no, 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 I wouldn't. I wouldn't. If you me. thought I did, you would charge nope, me. Nope, not necessarily. I to do with her death. Unfortunately, Matt was right. The detectives didn't have enough evidence to charge him and arrest him, so they had no choice but to let him and Angela go. About a week after the murder, Annie's funeral and memorial service was held with about a dozen detectives scattered throughout the property. With the killer still at large, the family's safety was top priority, but having detectives supervising this event also allowed them to keep an eye on their main persons of interest, Matt and Angela. Although they were considered suspects at this point, they were still innocent until proven guilty, and therefore, 
full custody of Alice was automatically granted to Matt upon the death of Annie. During the service, one detective actually sat directly beside Angela, and he noticed a cut about one and a half inches long on the back of her right hand, between her thumb and index finger. Unfortunately, having a cut on her hand wasn't sufficient grounds for an arrest. However, the police still had a few tricks up their sleeve. For the next stage in their investigation, they scoured the phones that Matt and Angela had surrendered earlier. What they found were pictures from Matt to Angela of a Payless Shoes coupon from November 8th. About an hour after that photo was sent, Angela responded with a photo from a shoe store of two different kinds of boots. The detectives went to a nearby Payless location and showed this picture to the manager, who was able to provide some key pieces of information. The type of shoe, one of the boots from a pair of Airwalk Muras, which matched the tread and size of the bloody footprint. The location of the store in the picture, it turns out all of the stores within the district had renovated their carpets, except for one, the Clackamas, Oregon location. This was the only location that still had the old carpet, which can be seen in the photo on Angela's phone. This location was only 10 minutes away from Matt and Angela's home. When the detectives went to this location, not only were they able to find the exact spot that the photo was taken, but they were also able to look at records from November and confirm that one pair of Airwalk mirrors had been purchased around that time. The owner of the credit card that was used to purchase these boots was none other than Angela Hester. Finally, using bootstrap police work, detectives had a solid piece of evidence against Angela. But they weren't done there. They were also able to obtain and string together incriminating surveillance footage from a multitude of cameras between Portland and Gresham. Beginning with footage from Matt and Angela's neighbor, just before 11 p.m., a silver Mazda SUV can be seen barreling down their street, though it is unclear which driveway it initially pulled out of. The Mazda continued on its 26-minute trip, eventually arriving at Annie's apartment at 11.23 p.m. Then, four hours later at about 3 a.m., the Mazda began its trip in the other direction, ultimately winding up in Matt and Angela's driveway, turning off the headlights before pulling in. As incriminating as this evidence was, in order to guarantee a successful prosecution, they needed hard forensic evidence, so they held off on any arrests as they waited for the DNA lab to work its magic. While they waited, they focused on one important question. Why would Matt and Angela want to kill Annie? They learned that the custody battle for Alice was uglier than previously thought, especially once Angela became more involved, to the point that she called the Department of Human Services on Annie for child neglect. This was an email Annie sent to a friend in response to this ordeal. So, someone at some point recently called DHS and Child Welfare. They sent me this letter letting me know that it happened, but are not looking into it at this time, as they do not see a need to get involved. I just cannot comprehend what the I did to deserve this level of in my life. I am so done dealing with this. Around this time, there were even accusations that Annie had abused Matt during their relationship. Shade was being thrown left and right, and in another email from the same time frame, Annie stated... Below is a lovely exchange where Matt is being antagonistic, uncooperative, and has basically stole a blanket to be really effing petty. If the accusations about Annie being abusive toward Matt and Alice were true, it would make sense why Matt and Angela were so hellbent on gaining full custody of Alice. But these emails made it appear like Matt had ulterior motives. The more detectives learned about Matt and Angela's lifestyle, the more they believed that it was for a less noble reason. It turns out that Matt referred to himself as a professional parent. He and Angela were both unemployed, so they paid the bills by collecting a plethora of disability benefits off of their children, to a sum of about $2,000 a month. Annie believed that this was a ploy, that Matt and Angela were both pathologizing their children's normal behavior in order to take advantage of government assistance. Moreover, it seemed like they were going to do the same with Alice. During the custody battle, when Alice was having trouble adjusting to the back and forth between the two households, Matt and Angela tried to convince the judge that this was a sign of bipolar disorder. Annie and her lawyer fought back, saying that Matt and Angela were only taking that stance because of the money that comes with it. In the end, the judge granted full custody to Annie, while Matt walked away with about $42,000 of debt and court fees and back child support. Along with this information, detectives also learned that Annie had about $125,000 worth of life insurance policies in her name. On June 16th, about a week after the murder, it turns out that Matt had called the insurance company to receive this payout. However, he was no longer the beneficiary since Annie had switched it during the divorce. 
To the detectives, the motives for killing Annie were clearly financial. In October of 2017, the detectives were notified that a match was made to the DNA found at the crime scene. Two profiles were found on the knife block in Annie's home. One was from Annie herself, and the other was from Angela Hester. Before moving in with an arrest, the detectives did some surveillance on the Hester family. Over the years since Annie's death, they had moved about 650 miles away to the city of Pocatello, Idaho. Here you can see Matt, the one with the debilitating, undiagnosed medical complication, doing a multitude of errands and chores with ease. On October 4th, law enforcement was finally ready for an arrest, but Matt and Angela were clearly not. In the car. No! In the car. I have kids that are going to be coming home. Tell me why you're arresting me. <laughs> why am I being arrested, you stupid f I have kids in the car. I don't <laughs> Matt told the police not to touch him and actively avoided being handcuffed. So, he was brought down to the station under resisting arrest charges. They brought Angela into the interrogation room for a third time to disclose her charges and, if she was willing to speak, ask her some more questions. And I'm going to cut to the chase. Okay? You are under arrest for asking murder. So you're saying that I killed her? Yeah. Okay. I would like a lawyer if that's the case. Okay. Because I didn't, I was at home. During the little conversation that they did have, the detectives noticed that Angela kept massaging the scar on her hand, precisely where they spotted that one and a half inch cut directly after the murder. This wasn't all. Apparently after the discussion, Angela instinctively used a napkin to wipe the lid of her water bottle before throwing it out. Almost as if she had gotten into a habit of wiping away her DNA. Also back in the interrogation room was Matt once again struggling to navigate the room due to his condition. I just want to get done so I can get home to the kids. Here's the deal, okay? Our investigation clearly shows that Angela committed the murder against Anastasia. We're not here to discuss if it happened. I don't care what you think. In fact, you've been under surveillance for the last two weeks by the U.S. Marshals. So we've got you walking across the parking lot at Costco, picking up soda boxes and water bottles, whatever you were doing. You're not limping. You're not walking with a cane. I'm not buying the fibromyalgia. I'm not buying it. Okay? The detectives decided to show Matt photographs of Annie's autopsy. That's her. She's cut the Andrew tried to decapitate her. Cut all the way through her jaw. Stabbed all over her face. Carved a Roman numeral on her chest. Based off the MDX. I don't have a choice but to accept that she did. Okay. Matt proceeded to hang Angela out to dry, saying he was sleeping until about 3 a.m. when Angela woke him up. Like, I just woke up, my wife's panicking, all I can think, okay, whatever you need, let's go get you. I think sure. So I'm going to go upstairs, I have a good shower, she is bleeding. What are you asking her? What is she saying? She didn't say anything. She was just shaking. Okay. Did you ask her what happened to her? Why is she bleeding? No, I was just going to get her calmed down. So the next day, cops knock on your door. They tell you that stage is dead. Okay. You know that your wife came home in the middle of the night, cut up and bloody, uh, and you go to take a shower. What are you thinking in your mind? Even though you don't want to do it, what are you thinking? It's possible that she didn't have According to Matt, at no point while helping his wife clean up the blood did he ask her what happened. The detectives had Matt cornered. He admitted to cleaning the blood out of the Mazda the next day and lying to the police about it, but he profusely denied having part in the planning of the murder until the detectives said this. Look, this is and this is where you need to think about it because of whether you or somebody else. Who else was involved in this? She talked about like, hiring something. Like she talked about hiring her ex Okay, Aaron. I can recall that we talked about murder for hire. You know, I recall that the number was thrown out like fifty thousand dollars. Here's what I would like to ask you to do: call him, discuss the murder for hire plots. I mean, you drive it. What you need to know? I got to know what's going on. To reiterate, the detective's plan was for Matt to call Aaron in an attempt to get a recorded confession. After a few minutes of laying out the game plan, Matt rang in. Hello? Hey, is Aaron there? Yeah. Hold on. Thanks. Let me okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay, what's up? Hey, um, I don't know if you guys know, but uh, Angela got arrested. I heard you were arrested. No, Angela's the one who got arrested. I just got out of the police station. I want to make sure that our story is the same. 
um, when I go in and talk to them again. So I, I'm not sure what you hey. know. Uh, like, did she talk to you I at all? Nothing. You know nothing. So, no. so you weren't involved in this at all. No. You didn't help her drive or anything like that. No. I just want to know if if Angela got a hold of someone to help her or if she did it on her own. So I know what to tell the cops when they ask me. Aaron? Aaron? Here. After this phone call, the police brought Aaron in for his own interrogation, as well as a polygraph test. Besides Matt's claims, it was determined that there was zero evidence of Aaron's involvement in both the murder and the discussions leading up to it, so the police let him walk free. Even though Matt did admit to discussing a murder-for-hire plot, cleaning up blood evidence, and lying to the police, he was let go for now too. Angela, on the other hand, was brought back to Oregon to face her charges, and most likely the death penalty. That was until 2019, when Oregon State narrowed the list of crimes eligible for the death penalty. Angela's crime, instead of the initial aggravated assault charge, was now classified as a first-degree murder and the death penalty was no longer a plausible option. Also in 2019, investigators finally moved forward with a warrant for Matt's arrest. You were under arrest for conspiracy to commit murder and solicitation to commit murder, the murder of Anastasia Hester. That is why we're here talking to you. It's signature on that line, please. You can choose to waive your rights. But no, I would like a lawyer. All right, Matt. Thank you so much. It was nice seeing you again. As stated, Matt's two charges were conspiracy to commit murder, and solicitation to commit murder. These were based on the admissions he made in his last interrogation, that he had discussed payment with Aaron aiming to have Annie murdered. While Angela ultimately pled guilty to her charges on her own volition, Matt took a plea deal resulting in his conspiracy to commit murder charge to be dropped. This could actually be beneficial for prosecutors. Should they ever press any more serious charges for Annie's murder in the future, they would avoid any problems with double jeopardy. Angela was sentenced to 25 years in prison with the possibility of parole after serving time. Matt was sentenced to less than five years in prison and was eligible for parole in March of 2023. While they were both in prison, Matt and Angela filed for divorce and are no longer in contact.